Okay. I on that note, we'll have to uh, not we'll have to, but we look forward to beginning. Uh, continue, I think, the second last in our series on how the Tanakh evolved with Dr. Moshe Sokolo. And tonight we're continuing, I think, on our uh, translations, I believe. And um, okay, we'll have this no, week's class. No. There will be a class, the last of the series next Wednesday night, Erev, Erev, maybe Erev Pesach, depending on how you define Erev. But um, okay, Makashah, Dr. Sokolo. No, actually, we're we're beyond uh, translation. Okay, that's my mistake. I didn't um, look at the, the sources to, yet. Okay, uh, I apologize. That's okay. That's it's all right. That's why I'm here. That's all right. Um, <laughs> we're we're going to uh, this evening. We'll, we'll have a look at some um, more uh, modern and more recent uh, um, approaches to uh, to uh, Tanakh. Uh, and uh, what I'd like to do next week as a conclusion uh, is spend the evening with you looking at a number of websites that focus on the study of Tanakh and that provide a variety of sources and tools for biblical study and investigation. So um, uh, we'll be focusing this this evening, uh, almost exclusively on um, Israeli uh, Bible study. Um, not that there is no contemporary Bible study outside of Israel, but there is nothing comparable to it. So um, I begin with a, a series of just the several um, quotations on the subject of Tanakh study from a variety of uh, mid to late 20th century uh, Orthodox figures whose uh, remarks were somewhat influential on uh, biblical studies. And, and we start with uh, Rav Kook, Rav Am Avraham Yitzchak HaKohen Kook, um, who uh, wrote the following in a letter to one of his students. Um, the student's name was Moshe Zeidel, and he was an early uh, uh, professor uh, of Bible uh, in Israel. You know that Rav Cook was present at the uh, founding of the Hebrew University. Uh, Moshe Zeidel was one of Rav Cook's foremost students, and he became, uh, in his lifetime, the foremost religious Bible educator in Israel. He was also the editor, the author and editor in just a couple of minutes. So uh, Rav Cook was asked uh, by um, uh, Moshe Zeidel to uh, address the challenge that biblical criticism had begun to present to um, traditional, traditional, largely religious Bible study. And Rav Cook wrote in response, there is no contradiction between anything in the Torah and any scientific theory in the world, but we are not obligated to accept speculation as though it were fact. He's referring here specifically to what is still called the documentary hypothesis, and it's still called a hypothesis primarily because it is unproven. So Rav Cook says that we're not obligated to expect to accept a, a an hypothesis as though it were factual, no matter how many people subscribe to it, even if it has many adherents, because he says that such speculations have the properties of a wilting flower, kind of like a kikayon of Yona, bin laila hayau bin laila avar, that it, 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 it just passes from the scene. Soon enough, Rabbi Cook was uh, kind of persuaded, the tools of exploration will be more developed, all these newfangled theories will be put to shame, and all the lofty sciences of our day will be proven false. Udvar Eloheinu Yakum Laolam, and the word of God will be sustained. Not say that um, that religious people should ignore biblical criticism. Rav Kook basically said that he was confident that biblical criticism would be ultimately 
It can't be disproven since it's never been proven. Okay. Norman Lamb uh, had the following to say, Torah is a Torah emet, a Torah of truth. And to hide from facts is to distort truth into myth. It is this kind of position which honest men, particularly honest believers in God and Torah, must adopt at all times, okay? meaning not to hide from facts, and especially in our times. Conventional dogmas, even if endowed with the authority of an Aristotle, ancient or modern, and again, he's referring to biblical criticism, must be tested vigorously. If they are found wanting, we need not bother with them. But if they are found to be substantially correct, we may not overlook them. We must then use newly discovered truths, not hide, as it were, from the challenges of biblical criticism. Which is interesting because for many years he was the president and later the chancellor of Yeshiva University where I taught Bible for many decades and biblical criticism was not part of anybody's curriculum. Yehuda Litzur, like Moshe's idol, was one of the foremost uh, religious Bible educators of archaeology at Bar Ilan University. And he had the following to say. A contemporary exegete, Parshan, is required, of course, to examine things in the light of contemporary knowledge. If he does so, then he is following in the footsteps of the ancients, of Chazal, even if he disagrees with them in a thousand details. On the other hand, he says, someone who only copies the ancients and shuts his eyes to newly discovered facts in knowledge is actually abandoning the ways of the ancients and rebelling against them. So again, he would embrace new information that's brought to light, brought to light by comparative Semitic languages and literatures, that's brought to light by archeology. span And again, addressing biblical criticism, Mordechai Breuer, whom we've spoken of previously said, what connection is there between all these critical arguments, which are demonstrable, legitimate, and well-founded, and the authentic Jewish belief that the Torah comes from heaven and that it preceded creation by 974 generations? That's a bit of an exaggeration, but it's the text of a Midrash. For even if the accuracy of biblical criticism were to be proven, its conclusions do not affect the pure Jewish faith, even one iota. That's a rather remarkable statement. It would be all the more remarkable, perhaps even judged as heretical, were it not for the fact that Maimonides, 700 years before Mordechai Breuer, said in the Moran of Uchim that if Aristotle's theory of the eternity of matter could be proven, it would not contradict the accuracy of Jewish tradition. So Mordechai Breuer was, but this again is just, you know, uh, hypothetical on his part, would be willing to accept even the conclusions of the documentary hypothesis if they could be proven. And indeed, as we spoke about him previously, um, his own approach to the biblical text called Shittat uh, HaBechinot, uh, the, uh, uh, the um, theory of perspectives, um, actually is willing to accept the proposition that, not, that the Torah is not one monolithic, seamless whole. Okay. Moreover, he says, the scientific conclusions of biblical criticism not only are harmless to faith, but are in fact, he says, essential and mandatory for anyone who seeks to interpret the Bible, whether they seek to interpret according to its pshat or according to its drash. This is just somewhat of an understanding to get a sense of what was the mentality of religious Bible scholars in Israel during 
largely the latter half of the 20th century, when most of the things that we're going to talk about this evening, like Da'at Nikra, which is coming next, um, um, were uh, begun. So, as I said, um, aware of the impact that biblical scholarship circles and beyond, Rabbi Cook inspired his student Moshe Zeidel, whom I spoke about just a moment ago, to embark on an ambitious project. Under Rabbi Dr. Zeidel's leadership, a group of scholars convened in 1956 and carefully formulated the principles that we'll see in a moment for a new verse-by-verse -verse traditional commentary on the entire Tanakh. The first assignments were given out in the early 1960s. The first two volumes were published in 1970 and in 2003. And this project entitled Da'at Mikra, literally Knowledge of Scripture, published by Mosada of Cook in Jerusalem, incorporates the search. Yehuda Kiel, one of the leading editors, I don't know whether there was a formal editorial board and whether he was formally the editor-in-chief, I'm not certain, but certainly one of the principal editors of Da'at Mikra, wrote in a retrospective on Da'at Mikra that the editorial board reached the conclusion that it is appropriate to arrange Da'at Mikra in several layers, one laid on top of or alongside the other. And here are the seven layers. Happens to be seven. I don't think it has anything to do with a seven layer cake. It probably has something more to do with the verse in Proverbs that says about wisdom, chatzava amudeha shiva'a, the seven pillars of wisdom. So the first level of Da'at Mikram is the biblical text. And the biblical text was refined, utilizing the Aleppo Code of the Masoretic text. Portion of Da'at Mikram was um, the same as the editor of the uh, Mosad Rav Kook, Yom Tanakh, following again the Aleppo Codex and related manuscripts. And that was again the late Mordechai Breuer. The second layer, in the commentary to the Torah, as well as to Shir Hashirim, that Mikra places alongside the biblical text, the commentary of Rashi. And again, a refined, reasonably critical edition of the commentary of Rashi, the one that was edited by the late Rabbi Charles Chavel, and according to the best manuscripts available to him. And an interesting thing, they deliberately set the commentary of Rashi in ordinary Hebrew type, and they added vowels to it in order to make it accessible to a larger reading public. In fact, the commentary, the original Da'at Mikra commentary, was also vocalized in order to facilitate reading. And the third level also in incorporates maps and illustrations as an inseparable part of the commentary. The fourth level below the commentary in smaller print are notes whose purpose is to provide support for the commentary, right, sources and the like, or to elaborate on it, or even to cite an alternate opinion in a case in which exegetes are reasonably divided on an interpretation. The fifth level, the editorial board also decided to precede each chapter with a thematic introduction, but they noted bearing literary markers at its opening or closing or both to determine the chapter's content and, and divisions. This, I would suspect, is under the influence of the late Nechama Leibovitz, who always uh, advised teachers that the first thing that they should have students do after actually reading aloud the text of the chapter that they were studying is what she called chalukata perek, to divide the chapter. The introduction also serves to give a reason for the incorporation of that chapter 
within the larger context of the book. If you're getting the sense that this is, um, that it, it is inclined uh, more towards a literary investigation of the Bible than either an historical or archeological one, then that is indeed the fact. The sixth level, a summary of the chapter that highlights its contents and its significance for both ours and other generations. Well, the gen, I'm sorry, this meaning the, the generation of the, of the text itself, as well as later generations, meaning it could dimension to it. And finally, the seventh layer, an introduction to the entire book, whichever the book of Tanakh was, and appendices that might contain a summary of all the contents of the book, focusing on its unity. That again is a response or a hedge against a critical approach and examining again its literary structure. Subjects that cannot be contained in the introduction are brought in an appendix. The introductions to most books are arguably books in themselves. And anyone who wishes to obtain a perspective on the entire Tanakh could do so by combining the separate introductions to its 24 constituent books. Rather than bring a passage from randomly one of the 24 books in the Dat Mikra series, I chose instead to bring an example from an atlas that was published by Da'at Mikra. And it touches on a subject that we have looked at previously from two different perspectives, one from an historical perspective and the other from the perspective of translations. And that is the series of, 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 of several verses at the beginning, uh, beginning of, of the Torah in Breshit Perek Bet, that um, describe and name the four rivers of paradise. Nahar, a river, Yotzeme Eden, emerged from the Garden of Eden. Lahashkot et Agan, in order to provide it with irrigation. Umisham. And then upon exiting the Garden of Eden, Yipare, that single river would split the Hayala Arba'a Rashim. And it then goes ahead and names them. The first one is named Pishon, and it is said to be Sovev et Kol Eretz Hachavila, that it either surrounds or winds through the land of Chavila. Asher Sam Sham Hazahav. Know nothing more about the land of Chavila other than there, there's gold in the land of Chavila. The second river was called Gichon, and it's described as winding through the land of Cush. Now, Cush is a little easier to identify than Chavila. In fact, there is not one, but two lands, biblical lands named Cush. There is a Cush in Asia Minor. And that's probably the Kush over which King Ahasuerus ruled, Mehodu Va'ad Kush. Right? There are even today in Afghanistan, right? The 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 um, uh, a mountain range named Kush. Okay. Then there is Kush that traditionally is identified with Ethiopia. Oh. No? But at least it's one of two places rather than Chavila, which could be any place. By the time we get to the third river, it's a little more identifiable. It's called the Chidekel, and it is described as flowing to the east of Assyria. And we already spoke about the fact that Chidekel even sounds a bit like Tigris, and it certainly is situated to the east of Mesopotamia. And the fourth river is simply called Prat. You don't have to say where, what country it, it goes through. All you have to say is Prat, and everybody knows because that's the river of Mesopotamia, the Euphrates. Okay. 
just a curiosity, this is where the, uh, the uh, atlas of Dat Mikra situates those four rivers. As you can see towards the top of the screen, the Chidekel and the Prat are the two rivers of Mesopotamia. You'll remember again, parenthetically, the word Mesopotamia means literally between the rivers, okay? However, the other two rivers are situated in Africa, okay? Not in Egypt, it's not identified, neither of them is identified with the Nile, the way Sa'ad Yaga'on identified the Pishon as the Nile, but rather they're identified with the headwaters of the Nile. I don't know whether you can actually read them, but the upper one is the and the one to the left of it, to the west of it, is the Nilos Halavan, the White Nile. Okay, um, you know that that was uh, who, who was a Kitchener went to the sources of the Nile. I don't really remember offhand which explorer it was, but um, the headwaters of the Nile are presumed to be in Lake Victoria, uh, in the southern part of the African continent. And there is a blue Nile and a white Nile and a red Nile. And somehow there is a confluence into what is generally regarded as the Nile that flows through the land of Egypt. In any event, as I said, this is just an illustration from the Atlas of Da'at Mikra. Dr. Sokolow. Just as Da'at Mikra. Dr. Sokolow, yes. can I, now I don't know if it's, you know, just me, but your internet's a little choppy tonight. I, I can, you know, it's generally fine. But every once in a while, so I don't know if there's something I just wanted to make you aware of. It. Are other people having this issue, or is it uh, just a mic? Yeah, yeah. So yeah, there's I'm something having that's it. also having the issue. Yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's you know we can make out what you're saying. I'm just I don't know if there's anything you can do about it. Sometimes these things happen, but I just did want to bring it to your attention. I don't know if you okay, got other I'm, things on. You can turn off that. Maybe the band. I, I don't and I don't know these things, but maybe you can turn off some other stuff that might be on. Etc. Otherwise, uh, go I, on, I, and we can. The, we have to listen more attentively. So we, uh, the couple words we miss, we have to put together. So, that's all. Um, okay. I, 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 at the moment, have, um, have uh, 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 what appears to me to be a full strength signal, um, and I've got nothing competing on my laptop. So, I just uh, that's the best I can do. Okay, somebody just saying, I don't know if you're on a, um, not, uh, what's it called? They should say you'd be wired in as opposed to um, new, the, uh, the other one where you're not, uh, you know, not a, a remote connection, have a connection with wired. That I don't know, but okay, go on. I just wanted to, whatever, if there was anything you could do about it. Otherwise, we'll, we'll continue. Um, I, I, the only thing I can try to do is change my location. You can try and see and see what happens. Maybe okay. right that does happen. Sometimes rooms of the house are, you know, one room is better than the next. I'm going to try. Give me a moment. Yeah, and we're that's fine. Thank you. Go near to where the 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 router is, wherever that might be. Can you turn the light on in this room? Okay, I, I can show you, as you can see, um, I am seated next to the router. That's about okay. as, <laughs> as good as we can get. Okay, okay, Vakasha. As good as we can get. Okay. Okay.
it, it hasn't seemed to change the strength of the signal, but in any event, it's okay. Mishana, Mako Mishana. Okay. So um, just as Dat Mikra is a series of modern Israeli Bible commentaries that was intended for a religious audience, um, Mikra Li Yisrael is a, a series of uh, Bible commentaries, Israeli authored Bible commentaries that are not necessarily intended for a religious audience. They're not by any means anti-religious. Um, they are not in, in a, 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 a pure sense, a totally secular series of commentaries. Indeed, some of the people who wrote commentaries for the Mikrali Israel series are themselves religious Bible scholars, but it was intended to appeal to a broader audience than, uh, than um, uh, the Dat Mikra series. Um, so as you see, it advertises itself as a novel professional Bible commentary. All the contributors are uh, professors of Bible in various universities that relies on what they call the stages of Jewish culture throughout the generations, meaning they, they pay their respects to rabbinic Bible study and to the study of the Bible in the Middle Ages, but the focus is primarily modern and contemporary. And its stated objectives, as you see, are to consider the best available information regarding the biblical text in that respect, they're identical with the Dat Mikra because the best available information is either the Aleppo Codex or those, um, those manuscripts, those codices that were similarly produced by the Ben Asher family. Paying attention to ancient translations, right, where they may reflect alternate readings in the biblical text and the evolution over time of the biblical text. Here, of course, there's a departure from a strictly religious position. Strictly religious position doesn't consider the text to have evolved. The third point is that values the artistic dimension of the Bible, and therefore it recognizes different literary types within it. Artistic here doesn't mean artistic in the sense of plastic arts or wants to consider the biblical text in light of extra biblical parallels. Okay. Uh, ancient Near Eastern literature, classical and modern commentaries, applying the best information about biblical Hebrew based on comparative Semitics and modern lexicography and grammar. Okay, this seems to be worse. Okay, doctor, I, did he disappear? He'll reconnect. My signal didn't change at all, just all jumped out. Don't know what's going on, sorry. Uh, yeah, you, we lost you for the last about, about 30 seconds or so. Now you're frozen. Okay. Do you think? Hello? Now we hear you. Yeah, okay. We didn't hear I, I don't know. I, I said just don't, don't know what, uh, what the cause is. If I knew, I, I could do something about it, but it just, you know. The Russians. Rabbi right. Kelman, are you, on my screen, you're frozen. Oh, no. Am I still frozen? Yeah. Okay. Uh, as long as you can hear me, I don't care if you're frozen. <laughs> Thank you very much. Oh, Rabbi Kelman, you're not, you're not frozen to us, Rabbi Kelman. Right, uh, okay. Thank you. Thank you. You, yeah, you, you just left. That's good. I, I saw that. You moved. Oh. Okay. Let's see what happens. Whatever. What, what can we do? We, I always say... 
This happens very rarely, but the, we should be have gratitude for the miracles of technology. And every once in a while, it doesn't work well to let us know that we should appreciate when it does work well. So that's all I can say. All right, let's try. We'll, we'll do the best. Okay, is the screen back up? Yeah, the screen is back up. Okay. Um, if it happens once more, you, you'll excuse me, I'm going to try to see if I can change anything by actually um, logging out and logging back right. in. I, yeah, okay. that's not a bad idea. Okay, let's okay. see what happens. So we, we were up to the point um, where um, uh, where they uh, want to, uh, they claim that they would cite the opinions of modern scholarship on the evolution of the canon, including the mutual relation of different biblical books, what they call interlia, in light of the latest archeological artifacts and historical theories, to examine the world of ideas of the Bible in light of both biblical and post-biblical thought. And finally, to present to the reader deliberations that arose over time regarding specific exegetical or historical matters that reflect the role of the Bible in Jewish and non-Jewish culture. So as you see, it's more historically oriented uh, than the Dat Mikra, and it's clearly intended for a broader audience. One of the contributors, however, to the Mikra the Israel series, actually the author of their commentary on the book of Yonah, is Professor Oriel Simon, um, a, a professor, religious professor of Bible at Bar Ilan University. Um, who um, is the author as well of a book uh, in English, it's called Reading Prophetic Narratives, of which of course the book of Jonah is a, uh, a foremost example. Uh, and here are some of the things that uh, Professor Simone writes in his introduction to reading prophetic narratives that give us some idea of how he handles this balance between the traditional and the modern critical approach. First of all, he reminds us that biblical stories were meant for readers, not critics. Therefore, he says, any criticism must be based on reading. The inner significance of a great work is apparent only to someone who is willing and able to read it as part of its target audience, meaning in order to get the real flavor of Tanakh, you have to sit and read it as though you were in the audience to which these words were being addressed for the first time. Second, he says, because of our great distance from scripture and its world, however, we cannot attain an unmediated and naive reading of it. It's, it's just simply beyond our, uh, our capacity to actually put ourselves in that place. Just as the language of scripture cannot be understood without philological research, so must the norms of scriptural narrative be investigated in order to reduce the gap between our contemporary reading habits and those of the readers of antiquity, which I would like to point out that the most obvious difference is, is that we read, they recited. Mentioned this in the past, the word mikra, which is the standard rabbinic name for the Bible means not to read as we customarily read with our eyes, right? Remember what your elementary school teachers would say to you, right? Why are you reading with your mouth, okay? We read silently. They read through recitation. So Mikra is not so much a book that you open and stare at with your eyes, as it is a book whose words you articulate. 30 says every generation is rooted in its own existential situation, and therefore it searches scripture for answers to its specific spiritual needs, and it reads scripture through what it considers to be reliable exegetical methods. And finally, method opens the door to another one of the Shivim Panim, the 70 facets of scripture. Coming more into the late 20th and now contemporary early 21st century, 
One of the most influential Tanakh teachers today, certainly in the religious world, is Rabbi Yoel Binon of Herzog College, who, in his own of his colleagues, a result of the fact that he is a rather unusual individual who is able to address questions of an historical archaeological nature, as well as literary and, uh, and other exegetical questions. He combines expertise in Tanakh, Chazar, Parshanot, Halacha, history, archaeology, linguistics, and theology. He actively confronts biblical criticism by using its own tools of scholarship to respond to the challenges that it raises. While Rabbi Breuer, Mordechai Breuer, in his own writings, steered clear of historical criticism and concentrated exclusively on literary issues, Rabbi Ben Nun believes that these disciplines, when studied responsibly, can be combined harmoniously and deepen our understanding of Tanakh and other areas of Jewish thought. And I bring you one example, text of the book of Joshua, combining archeology span and theology. Any split in the book of Joshua between chapter 12 and chapter 13. The first 12 chapters of the book of Joshua convey the impression that Israel's conquest of the land of Canaan was complete. Chapter 13 opens, if you recall, with the words, Vizot ha'aretz ha'nish'eret. This is the land that remained to be conquered. And chapters 13 to 19 then go ahead and list many unconquered cities. Now, medieval parshanim were aware of this, okay? And they attempted to harmonize the discrepancy between the two halves of the book of Joshua, as it were. Radak, for example, suggested that Israel first secured the borders of the land, right? So that to a certain extent, by the end of chapter 12, the land had been conquered. But after they had secured the borders, they were then first able to successfully attack and to take over the, the, the land within the borders. Ralbag, on the other hand, suggested that since the major battles had been completed by the end of chapter 12, it was as though the entire land had been conquered. With the rise, however, of secular literary and historical scholarship, more iconoclastic suggestions were raised. And scholars argued that Joshua 1 to 12 and 13 to 19 represented conflicting traditions. One tradition was that the conquest was completed all at once, and the other was that the conquest took in stages over a passage of a considerable amount of time. Archaeologists, in fact, insisted that the total conquest described in the book of Joshua was simply not corroborated by findings in Israel. Rather, they maintained that the available evidence suggests that it's not a, not a one-time conquest, but a gradual settlement of the land, as I said, over an extended period of time. With his expertise in both Tanakh and history and archaeology, Rabbi Bin Nun set out to refute those arguments. And he maintained that according to time in the book of Joshua as having been destroyed, completely burned to the ground, were the cities of Yericho, Ai, and Chatzor. Contrary to our initial impression of a total conquest, some of the 30 could not be immediately conquered even after Joshua's victories. Therefore, most of Israel's victories were of one army against another in the battlefield. The campaign described in Joshua 1 to 12 broke the back of the Canaanite military coalitions, but did not necessarily extend to the conquest of their cities. Pretty much similar to what Radak had proposed about an initial conquest of all of the border areas, and then subsequently able to then move inwards and to take up the actual cities. Thus, a comprehensive reading of the book of Joshua suggests a gradual settlement of the land. Again, it could be a one-time conquest, 
but yet a gradual settlement of the land, since most of the Canaanites, most of the cities remained in the Canaanite hands, even after the major Canaanite coalitions had been defeated. Similarly, archeologists should not expect to uncover any more than three destroyed cities dating to Joshua's period, again being Yericho, Ai, and Chatzor. Rabbi bin Nun argued that archeological evidence corroborates the destruction of Ai and Chatzor in Joshua's time, and we do not have conclusive evidence one way or the other from current findings in Jericho. In sum, the archeological record is largely consistent with the account in the Tanakh if one reads the text and considers the archeological evidence carefully. In addition to his many articles on the subject, Rabbi Binun started a few years ago a new series of commentaries of his own. I actually spoke about these in a previous session. He called it Mikraot. It's kind of like a play on the word Mikra, okay? And it's subtitled Iyun Rav Tchumi Ba Torah, a multidisciplinary approach to Torah. What are the different disciplines? Rabbinic Midrash and Parshanut, mostly those of Rishonim, that would be Rashi and Ibn Ezra and Radak and Rambam, arranged topically. Biblical language, an analysis of the Masoretic text and the Ta'ameha Mikra. The order of the parashiot and the narrative structure, the whole question of mukdamu me'uchar, can we read the Torah consecutively or do we have to skip around? providing a scientific background, the history, the geography, the archeology, span and what he calls new parshanot, and he justifies it as though it needed justification by citing a well-known observation of Rashbam, who says that his grandfather Rashi admitted that if he had the time, he would have to rewrite many of his individual interpretations because he says, Hapshatot mitchadshim bechol yom. That insights into pshat, which means a determination of what the text means based on philology, based on history, based on archaeology, these are the kinds of things that can change from not literally from one day to the next, but they certainly can change from one generation to another, and certainly from one era to another, as the tools of philological and historical and archeological investigation become sharper. While Lauren Schiffman uh, is better known for his work in the Dead Sea Scrolls, than his work on the Bible, and why he is an American professor rather than an Israeli professor, I wanted to bring here because, again, he has something um, uh, to tell us uh, about the way in which he, as a religious scholar of the Bible and a religious scholar of the Dead Sea Scrolls and of the history of that period, views the relationship between scientific study, historical, archaeologically based study of biblical and other texts, and the religious traditional approach. And he tells us that ancient Near Eastern literature, right, is something that archaeologists began digging up in the 19th century in Mesopotamia and in Egypt, and we now have access, right, to many of the uh, ideas, and in some cases, even the words in which those ideas were expressed, that Wokar Hamavinu lived, amongst whom Moshe Rabbeinu lived, etc., etc. And he provides a couple of examples of how we can use these archaeological and literary discoveries to our advantage. He gives an example. Atrahasis is the Babylonian epic of creation. And from that epic, we learn of one particular version of the Mesopotamian creation and flood epic. If we look at the text, we see the contrast between the Mesopotamian account and the biblical story. In the Mesopotamian account, humanity is created to serve the gods. 
They are to be, they are puppets, right, whom the gods control, and they, they bring sacrifices because the gods hunger, and they pour libations of wine because the gods thirst. Therefore, by the way, in Mesopotamian law, the value of a human life was determined on the basis of how much that person could contribute to the temple, to the gods. And obviously somebody who could make a greater contribution to the temple and to the gods was literally worth more than somebody whose contribution was of a lesser order. I'll just summarize this rather than reading through it. According to the Mesopotamian epic, flood, for example, the gods brought the flood to the human beings who were making too much noise and they were disturbing the gods' rest. That has no moral dimension to it at all, as opposed to the biblical story of the flood that says that the flood was brought because mankind was wicked. At least it introduces an element of morality into the story. According to the Babylonian version of the flood story, the um, Utnapishtim, who is the Noah of Mesopotamia, the, the single person who survives the flood, survives because one of the gods was just simply uh, Bruges, uh, was at odds with the other gods. And since they wanted to destroy all of mankind, he said, I'm going to fool them. I'm going to make sure that one of them survives. Whereas according to the biblical story, Noah isn't someone just chosen randomly to survive the flood, but he's chosen because literally he was Sadiq Bedorotah. I know Rashi, doesn't matter whether he was living in the generation of Abraham or not, surely everybody agrees it's a Kule Alma in his own generation, he was righteous. So again, the element of morality that's totally absent in the Mesopotamian epics is emphasized in the biblical story. And here just a, a, an observation of my own. In the story of the, um, of the Tower of Babel, the Tower of Babel clearly, based on all archeological and literary and artistic evidence of the ancient Near East, was intended to be a ziggurat. You may remember what the ziggurats were, they're terraced or stepped pyramids, okay? And they were believed by the ancient people in Mesopotamia to be a bridge between earth and heaven. And the very top of the ziggurat was actually referred to in literature as the place where heaven and earth meet, okay? We therefore understand that what the Bible saw wrong in the Tower of Babel is not that the Bible is uh, opposed to people living in tall buildings, okay? I'm sure that the 17 story building that I live in was considerably taller than any ziggurat that the Mesopotamians ever built, okay? It isn't the height of the building, but it's rather the notion behind it that somehow by building up, you were reaching heaven. That by the way is probably why the rabbis decided that the, that the fatal flaw in the Migdal Bavel was that the people who built it were intent upon rebelling against God. That they said in the language of the Midrash, if we build this building, we'll be able to go up into heaven and we can throw God out and we can take over heaven and we will thereby guarantee that there will never be a flood again. But at one point the Pasuk says, and you see it before you, Vayered Hashem lirot et ha'ir ve'et ha'migdal asher banu b'nei ha'adam. That God came down to look at the city and the tower that b'nei ha'adam, that human beings had built. And there's a curious Rashi here. Rashi says, why does it have to say that it was built by b'nei adam? Who else would have built it? It certainly could have been built by the children of b'nei chamorim or gmalim. Okay. But we understand if we compare the biblical story of the Tower of Babel to what we know about the building of ziggurats in Babylonia, we know that it was precisely because they saw themselves as ascending these towers and assuming as it were divinity on their own that the Torah told to tell us, 
You think that by building a ziggurat, you can go up into heaven and you can rival God? No matter how high you build your ziggurat, God still has to descend in order to get to it. Another example of literary theological approach to Tanakh is that of Rabbi Yochanan Samet, also a teacher of Tanakh at Herzog College. And again, just bring a, an, an example here. I, I really don't want to, um, to uh, uh, belabor it, um, but uh, I think we have time. Uh, I'll just keep. One of Rabbi Samet's hallmark literary techniques is to divide a passage, whether it's narrative or legal, in half. For example, okay, if we take Parashat Vayetze, the story that begins with Jacob's dream and ends as Jacob is leaving um, uh, Aram Naharayim and is on his way back to the land of Israel, okay, and it encompasses in that time the period that he spent in service to Lavan in order to acquire his wives and his children, and another period of service to Lavan in which he acquired a considerable wealth in terms of sheep and, I suppose, cattle and the like, okay? So, in the, in the Sidra Vayetze, Rabbi Samet contends that the entire parasha forms a, liter, a literary unit. And the center of the unit is a turning point that changes the course of a story. The Sidra Vayetze is 148 verses long. Precisely at its center, Lavan invited Yaakov to remain in Aram Naharayim after he had served the seven years for Rachel and the seven years for Leah. He consented to remain yet another period of seven years in order to work for wages, the, the sheep and the cattle that he acquired. Surprisingly, Yaakov agreed to stay for an indeterminate period, rather than saying, I have a family, I already have enough sheep and cattle, it's time for me to return to the land of Canaan. And according to Rabbi Samet, this turning point signals a transition from the first half of the Sidra, which was largely positive, to the second half, which is largely negative. In the first half, solely to earn money, something that he could have done back in the land of Canaan as well, to the point that his increasing wealth aroused the jealousy of Lavan's family, and it ends up with Rachel having to sneak out of her father's house having stole some of his household idols, the Teraphim, which in turn causes Lavan to cast, as it were, a curse upon her, which even according to some medieval commentators, is the reason that she died before actually returning to the land of Israel. And his point at the bottom is, well, there's no ethical living, Yaakov, however, was obligated to return to the land of his ancestors in order to fulfill a vow that he had made in Beit El, Vishavti Bishalom Le Beit Avi, and in order to honor his parents. Finally, just a couple of things about the role that Tanakh plays in, in the land of Israel today in Yeshivot Gevohot, something that is a novelty in Jewish history. The only reference that I could actually find, it's possible that in some of the yeshivot in Italy, in the late Middle Ages and the early modern period, that there actually were formal or official classes in Tanakh. But we just simply don't have enough either historical or literary evidence for it. But the, what we know about Italian Jewry in general could support such a conclusion. Otherwise, the only only reference I could find to a yeshiva gedola with a positive attitude towards the study of Tanakh was in the yeshiva of Volozhin at the tail end of the 19th century uh, under the leadership of the Nitziv, Rav Naftali Tzvi Yuda Berlin, who in addition to being a Rosh Yeshiva, wrote a commentary, the Hamek Davar, on the Torah, and who is uh, in 
the memoirs that were kept by students in Volozhin, he is described as having, as it were, maybe like a soft spot in his heart for students who studied Tanakh. Uh, yeah, let me uh, skip this on to the constraints of time and just end with three quotations. Um, Rabbi Yuval Sherlo was a student at Yeshivat Haaretzion, uh, as uh, uh, was um, uh, Rav uh, Yoel Binun, and certainly Rav Yaakov Medan, who is currently one of the Rashi Yeshiva in Yeshivat Haaretzion. Rabbi Sherlo on one occasion wrote what you see before you, Haloa Tanach Hu Sefer HaSvarim. Tanach is the book of books. Yisod HaMunakula, it is the foundation of our faith. Hamakom HaYachid Shebo Yesh Lanu Maga Im Devar Hashem Ba'ofan Yashir. It is the only place in which we, the readers, make direct contact with the word of God. So he asks, Madua lo hayaha tanach chelak bilti nifrad me olam halimud hatorani. Why is the study of Tanakh not on a par with the study of Gemara in the Yeshivot? On the Rabbi Yoel bin Nun, on the one hand, attributed to the late Rabbi Yuda Mital a revolutionary declaration of the parity of Tanakh and Talmud, quoting Rav Amital as having said, limud Tanakh bi'iyun, right? The, the in-depth study of Tanakh, hu chelek milimud Torah, is an integral part, is a legitimate function of Torah study, v'hu yihiyeh b'veit ha-midrash. And it will have a place in the Beit Midrash, and indeed it did and does till this day in Yeshivat Haaretz Yom. Uh, However, Rav Meidan, Rav Amital's successor, while himself in monographs in the field of Tanakh, denied that Rav Amital intended to imply that the study of Tanakh could ever be considered the equal to the study of Talmud, and has in saying, that without erudition in Gemara and in halachic decision making, which he calls the spinal cord of tradition, Torah will not have an effective revival. So what we're left with is certainly over the last generation, a considerably greater, greater both quantitatively and qualitatively focus on the study of Tanakh on, on the highest levels in religious institutions in Israel, but yet nowhere's nearly the amount of time and effort and resources that are available in comparable institutions to the study of Gemara and Halacha. With that, I will have a look at the chat and tell you that what I intend to do next week is to spend the evening looking, as I said earlier, at websites. There are considerably more than, but there are roughly half a dozen websites that are unique in terms of the uh, either the information or the tools, or in some cases, both information and tools that they offer for serious high-level Bible study, and we will uh, spend some time looking at them. Okay, what do we have here? Uh... 10, 7, I think it's accidental. I don't think that anybody went out to design seven levels because the number seven is a, is a, a, a you know, a, a significant number or 10, I just, you know, anyway. Um, Divine Surgeon General determined that Ziggurat 
cigarette smoking bad for one's spiritual that's health. Yeah, that's what we say. No, that's not a joke. We say altif tachpela sartan. Okay, uh, the last updated page added to the source sheet. I, I will again. I'll, I'll send it I, to, to Rabbi Kalman. Indeed, by all means. That's it. We, we sent last week's update. We 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 did put on right because we also had that last week. We added the new source sheet when the the introduction to translation from that week. Okay, happy to replace it. Okay. Thank you very much. It was a, a little bit at the end. I know Yasha to everybody for, for listening more attentively for the, uh, and I apologize with nothing, uh, whatever I can do here on our end, but uh, our apologies nonetheless for the little bit of the choppy class tonight. And um, thank you for, for staying with us. Okay. Uh, we look forward to learning with you uh, tomorrow. Shuli Mishkin will be at 12 noon Eastern on the Exodus and Archaeology. Um, and then tomorrow night, Rabbi Nadi Helfgod will be giving our Parsha Shir at 8.30. And then Friday morning, I'll be giving our Siddur Shir at 9 a.m. And uh, we look forward to learning with you next week. Um, we'll have a number of classes. Um, the... Menachem Liebtag on Sunday morning, Mark Shapiro Monday night, um, <clears throat> Tuesday, Rachel Sharansky, Wednesday, Dr. Sokolo, um, and then I will probably give a shear on the Haggadah. I'll figure out exactly what time, um, pro probably maybe on, on Thursday instead of in the morning, instead of the regular night shear, but uh, we'll keep you posted by emails. We'll let you know exactly what's happening, and then we'll... Um, we will um, soon, uh, over, over Cholamoy, we'll probably have very little, and then we'll, we're will we going to restart up with the whole series of Shirim right after Pesach that uh, isn't quite yet being advertised or publicized, but it's almost ready to go, about uh, 10, 11 Shirim a week um, coming up after between Pesach and Shavuot. Okay, anyways, uh, thank you, and invite your friends, and uh, we one friend, right, right, because if you have, tell you invite 10 friends, you don't invite them, so you invite one friend, maybe you will, and um, okay, if uh, everybody have a Lilo top, thank you, we get to see another room in your house, Dr. Sokolow, see that, that's the advantage of Zoom, with the map on the left uh, behind you, I can't quite tell what that's the map of, it's a little hard to read, it's Jerusalem. Oh, Jerusalem. Okay, it's it's one of these uh, modern uh, uh, maps of Jerusalem. Okay, artistic representations of Jerusalem. Okay, good. So you hold on. What what floor do you live on? Okay. You said you're in the seventeenth floor. Night. Okay. Good night. Okay. Lila Tov. Okay. Lila Tov. Be well, everybody. Okay. We'll see you soon.